All right. And that brings us quite nicely to Kat Manning, a noted oh, wow. baseball expert, baseball explainer. Uh, so to describe the rest of what you do, because it's not all baseball, Kat Manning's a narrative designer and writer currently at Riot Games. She's also worked on critically acclaimed indie narrative games, including Pathologic 2 and Where the Water Tastes Like Wine. Her interests include procedural narrative generation, ancient Greek drama, and making unwise decisions, as evidenced by her PhD in literature. And yes, recently also known for wonderful baseball explainers. Ah, thank you so much. Um, please do let me know uh, if my volume is okay. Um, but Sounds otherwise, let's just jump in here. Hey, uh, so as you just heard, I'm Kat Manning, and today I will be talking to you about how to design meaningful character traits that work with the game systems and which support interesting emergent stories. If a designer does this well, uh, you get interesting characters that are unique to every playthrough, but there are failure states too when there are too few interesting traits, when there's not meaningful differentiation between several traits on offer, when traits don't match up with what players expect of them, and a lot of others. So let's start with what are traits? What are they for and what do they do? So the concept of a trait is a pretty fuzzy category, but for the purposes of our talk here, I'm gonna define it as an in-game word that gestures at a procedurally generated character's personality and also has some mechanical ties to the game's underlying systems. They're simple, often binary. A character either has a trait or they don't. This itself is a narrative oversimplification of reality, but that's kind of the point of traits. They're about gesturing at a picture rather than illustrating one in great and exhaustive detail. And sometimes traits are the focus of mystery. Ultimately, they should offer clear hooks to a game's mechanics that allow players to imagine and extrapolate their own stories from what's happening. Traits are a vector for storytelling that allow players to parse information presented to them in games with dense systems that otherwise give them an overwhelming amount of data. So to talk about traits that feel very vivid and expressive on first looking at them and what potential issues they might have, let's take a look at The Sims 3. The original intention was, I suspect, to produce a robust and vivid pool of traits that players could use to create unique feeling characters. While the game was successful in offering players expressive granularity, there were some trade-offs. First, many traits in fact had a great deal of mechanical overlap, leading to indistinct gameplay effects. Second, the sheer number of the game's maximalist systems meant that later traits either joined an already overwhelming set of overlapping simulated behavior, as we see, or were confined to showing off an expansion pack's features in an entirely self-contained way, which led to the trait feeling comparatively meaningless. The Sims 3, which was released in 2009, moved away from The Sims 2's binary personality system, which had personality points distributed among five fixed traits, and instead added a number of unique traits, most of which were positioned orthogonally. I'm borrowing that term from Emily Short, who uses it to mean traits which are not directly correlated to each other. Sims who have the trait friendly do not necessarily end up with the trait party animal, for example. The player can put those two together and correlate those traits mentally in their model of the Sim, but the game itself does not impose that. With the exception of some binary traits like slob and neat or good and evil, the game doesn't close out traits. And while it splits them into four overall categories, it doesn't require players to pick a certain amount from any category or cap the number that they can choose from a category. But in the attempt to add more granularity to character behavior, the game ended up with multiple similar traits. This is an issue that Kate Compton points out in what she's termed the 10,000 bowls of oatmeal problem, that what we're looking for in a system is perceptual uniqueness rather than indexical uniqueness. 10,000 bowls of oatmeal with grains arranged differently are still going to look like 10,000 bowls of oatmeal. And The Sims 3 falls into something similar. It presents these traits in ways that lead the player to expect them to be perceptually unique, but then undermines that a little bit by essentially offering the same gameplay affordances. So traits that govern social behavior fall into this most noticeably. So let's take a look at this next slide. Uh, if this were a live talk, I would ask you if anyone can tell me the difference between irresistible and flirty. So if we're talking about my sense of what these words mean in natural language, I would tell you that flirty is how a person reacts to the outside world and irresistible is how someone reacts to them. But both of these traits are going to impact a similar set of actions. 
how often the active sim's flirt action is successful, and the base attraction of the target sim to the active sim. The mechanical difference is that romantic actions are available to flirty sims at a lower romantic score than uh, with their partner, while irresistible sims still have to wait, but they build up romantic scores faster. So, which means from the player's perspective that the effect isn't really that distinguishable. It just means that flirtatious actions are available for sims with the traits earlier in the get to know a romantic partner loop. The same overlap happens with social traits like friendly, charismatic, and schmoozer. Now, there's clearly a, diff a desire to offer players different ways to have a romantically or socially successful character. If I describe somebody as charismatic, I don't always mean that they're warm. And if I called someone a schmoozer, I would probably basically be insulting them. But the fact that they share a common mechanical overlap is frustrating in gameplay. If there's a meaningful difference to the player, it's in how the, the player interprets the words, not in being surprised by emergent gameplay. And in that sense, there is a perceptual difference in how these traits are presented, to, are, are presented and how the player might act then, given how they think about the Sims personality. So traits in this case are much more about co-authoring than they are about giving the game distinct patterns of NPC behavior. The Sims 3's tendency toward maximalism was further exacerbated with the release of expansion packs, as historically happens with the franchise. But because there were already so many expressive traits which overlap with each other, new traits often either felt like this expansion pack's version of a pre-existing trait, or entirely designed to show off feature X of this expansion pack, as we can see. As a result, their integration into previously existing systems is pretty shallow. Now, there were obviously mechanical reasons for this. Designers couldn't anticipate which previous expansions players might own, and so had to only draw on base game possibilities. But it had the effect of making an already crowded space feel more cluttered. There are also traits that seem like great ideas, which model realistic behavior that players can recognize and relate to. Consider the absent-minded trait, which on paper means that absent-minded sims will occasionally stop an action they're doing, get up, pause, and then go do something else, like so. Stopping for water. You can probably see where this is going. Absent-minded sims became infuriating for some players, right? Because they had to be constantly monitored to make sure that whatever a player had set up in their queue for them to do hadn't just been randomly dropped. The trait took away from gameplay rather than opening up new options. It was a great idea as an attempt at realistic simulation, and it even passes the test of telling a story with something that ties into systems, but it completely disrupted the core loop of gameplay. So my takeaway here is that no matter how interesting a trait seems on its own, even if it's technically interlinked to the rest of your game's systems, you do still need to consider how your traits will interface with the rest of your core loop so you don't create a UX nightmare and frustration for your players. Essentially, having expressive traits rather than tightly mechanical traits worked for The Sims 3 because it had a significant number of pre-existing system that those traits could link into. Character appearance, home decor, profession choice, etc., were ways that players could incorporate those traits into the gameplay, even when the behavioral AI didn't distinguish between them or otherwise surface them explicitly. Having cluttery, overlapping, cascading traits worked because The Sims 3, and the Sims series in general, is already a game that's full of clutter by design. Sometimes players even create more and add, upload it to sites as mods. The power fantasy in the game is to have it all, is to have everything. There's nothing stopping a player from putting a giant exercise room in their kitchen above a reflecting pool while their wife grows immortality fruit in the backyard in between her vacations to exotic locales. So it wasn't really an issue that diva and natural born performer might read the same way to a casual player on first glance in the same way that it wasn't an issue that Sims had multiple different exercise options. The plethora was the point. Dwarf Fortress is another game with maximal systems. It's probably the most complex proc gen simulation ever created. Its approach to character is deeply entwined with its numerous other systems. Dwarves' happiness, or if you've played more frequently, their unhappiness with their life and their surroundings is influenced by a complex metric of traits. Because there are so many things that can affect the fortress, the game can sustain a complex internal web of personality traits for dwarves because there are so many ways for them to get expressed. This can sometimes be an issue since it's not always well foreground to the player when and how particular traits are coming into play it can turn into a bit of a puzzle to figure out why one particular dwarf is consistently sadder than its peers, 
But that's kind of interesting, right? If we find a character with inherent personality contradictions, that means they'll struggle to be happy. Well, that's a story right there. Dwarves possess both beliefs and facets. The former determines what they value and will influence how often a dwarf attempts to fulfill that need. Facets, on the other hand, are traits that every dwarf exhibits on a sliding scale of negative 50 to 50. Those determine how a dwarf acts with respect to other dwarves and their surroundings. Crucially, a dwarf can hold contrasting beliefs and facets. A dwarf can have a high friendship belief and a low friendliness personality facet, which would give you a character who cares about making friends, but is too busy quarreling with everyone they meet to form real bonds, and that will lead you to a sad dwarf. As I've mentioned before, these are examples of orthogonal traits. Both Emily Short and Tanya Short have pointed out that we often correlate aspects of personality that don't need to be correlated. For instance, not all extroverts are loud and not all introverts are shy. Dwarf Fortress, by decoupling what characters want from how they behave, creates a really interesting system for that value clash and thus for emerging stories about that value clash. Not every dwarf is going to have particularly interesting or surprising stories though. And the stories that are the most interesting and strangest often take work to extract from the simulation. Every dwarf has a plethora of information about it that is overwhelming, and so players have to decide where they're going to choose to focus on. Often that's determined by what catches their eye, if there's a dwarf that's essential to the fort's functioning, for instance, but also if a particularly strange or puzzling thing happens. That's often difficult to trace backward, because while the game does foreground dwarves' traits, there's so much information that it's often hard to tell what trait is causing the observed behavior and what else is feeding it. What we can see here is that a game's procedurally generated traits don't just narrativize on their own. The process requires the player to do at least some of the work, and how much depends on how prominently these traits are foregrounded and brought to the player's uh, attention as attributes that can actively impact that gameplay. There's a sliding scale here between how much you want to clearly surface to players and how much you want, to do them, want them to do the work. And you should consciously decide where you want your game to fall uh, on that spectrum and design for that. The Shrouded Isle is very different in scale and intent. It's a much more focused game with a more par uh, pared down core loop than either the Sims or Dwarf Fortresses. As the leader of an eldritch cult, you're tasked with keeping your people's virtues balanced while preparing them for the ultimate ascension by which I mean ritual human sacrifice, of course. Everyone's traits appear obscured at first, and the core gameplay is about discovering those traits and purging your community of the worst sinners so that they can't run amok. Traits are regular and relatively simple. Everyone has a virtue and a vice that corresponds to one of the cult's five values. The game is about discovering these traits by making educated guesses, but the more time you spend investigating a character, the more interesting they become. Players don't discover traits right away, but they get hints at what value the mystery trait corresponds to. These hints paint a more vivid picture of the cult's austerity and cruelty. The people you usually end up executing are often more interesting and sympathetic the more extreme their vices are. Traits, then, are both the focal elements of the central puzzle and also do some pretty heavy lifting in terms of what is considered an outrage in the world of Shrouded Isle. A scholar or an artist is as much of a sinner as a pervert or an embezzler. These traits end up being much more clearly foregrounded than the traits in Dwarf Fortress, but then they have to be. In a game that's already punishingly balanced, where it's very easy to have the cult fail and disband, traits and their effect need to be legible enough to players who are actively engaging with the game's systems. The game feeds on the tension generated by having to kill the most interesting characters, those the players have spent the most time investigating and knows the most about. This system of trait design wouldn't necessarily work in The Sims 3 or in Dwarf Fortress, but it's effective here, and that's important to note. Good trait design depends very heavily on what you need them to do and how much you need your players to understand when they actually do the work of making sense of those traits. Crusader Kings 2 ends up somewhere between Shrouded Isle and Dwarf Fortress in terms of how prominently it brings its traits and their effects to the player's attention. This makes sense, since a character's traits influence a player's success or failure in the actions they'd like to take, but aren't obtrusive enough to prevent a desired action. A craven character can still declare war, for example. They're in a fairly prominent position, as you can see, uh, and are depicted by icons, and on mouseover, they'll tell you the effects on gameplay that each trait has. Many are linked into multiple systems, including NPC opinion, stats influence, piety, etc. And the game is pretty clear about surfacing how players can expect to see characters' traits having an impact on player-driven choices. 
Some traits are genetic, but many are gained, lost, or changed during Crusader Kings event chains, which have multiple parts, take place over time, and often require spending money, prestige, or piety. And sometimes they let you pet a cat, which is great. Traits are unclear in some ways, though. They're all together in that one prominent position. So when you have a particularly long-lived character who engages with a bunch of event chains, you get this overwhelming litany of icons that are pretty dif difficult to differentiate if you take a look uh, here now. A player can end up with something like a 60 plus learning score and discover where that comes from by tracing back those points to inherited dynastic traits, genetic traits, and event chain results. The effect tends to be that of a character actor rapidly running through a monologue of every Shakespearean monarch all at once, where individual traits might stand out for a second, but are otherwise going to blend into a cacophony. But we don't need every character in Crusader Kings 2 to have tons of interesting traits, actually. It makes the characters who do have an intriguing combination of traits, or otherwise interesting, easier to pick out from a pool of hundreds. In the appendix to the Annals of the Perigues, Emily Short lays out a system for procedural content classification that I found really useful in my own work. And this design here fits the, uh, the principle uh, of venom, is what she calls it. In venom design, vivid, statistically less likely, or spiky moments stand out and provide variation that's supposed to surprise. Now, Crusader Kings 2 doesn't go full venom on its traits, and as a result, it's a little bit of a mixed bag. They wanted traits corresponding to the seven deadly sins, but gluttonous or greedy is a much less interesting trait than lustful or wrathful, at least in terms of the game's systems and affordances. It fits the flavor and values of the world, like we saw earlier with The Sins 3, but it's less good in telling in, in terms of something that's going to generate compelling story choice. Now, fortunately, there are enough traits that do stand out, but frustration around the less interesting traits is reduced. They can mostly just be flavor. This also applies to characters. There are enough interesting characters that the hundreds of less interesting ones are fine as a supporting cast. And in fact, if all of the hundreds of characters had wildly interesting black backstories that the players could extrapolate around, then it would quickly become overwhelming. Uh, I will say that the calculus for designing what percentage of characters should be affected by a venom spike depends on the sort of game you're making. A handful of really interesting characters out of hundreds works very well for uh, the Crusader Kings franchise, but if you have a game where you have five characters and you have to interact with all of them, then the Venom principle of two or three of those characters are interesting probably won't serve you particularly well. Crusader Kings 2 was very good at giving players enough hooks to make interesting stories, but eventually those stories could end up feeling the same. Players could become familiar with the authored pool of events and know what led to the treats they liked the best and preferred. The Way of Life expansion offered an, interme an intermediary solve to this that they've expanded on and incorporated in Crusader Kings 3. Players could choose a focus for their characters that opened up new events which were more closely correlated and which fed into and created coherent character narratives that, and players had some influence over them because they could then choose the focus. This works against orthogonal trait design and attempts to correlate things like hedonist and lustful. And in this case, that works really well. When you're designing traits that lock into systems, a mixed approach can often be a benefit, uh, especially if you already have a strong focus on one design and it's gotten you as far as it can already. Crusader Kings 3 is still pretty new, but it's attempting to make interesting solves to some of the previous game's issues. In 2, traits influenced five hidden AI stats, which determined the frequency with which an NPC would make a particular decision, but it was impossible to tell how they influenced those unless you looked under the hood. Crusader Kings 3 surfaces those AI stats slightly more by having an adjective noun epithet attached to every character, and you'll see some examples of that here, uh, which tells you how they're generally likely to behave. A lot of zealots in this one. These are correlated to nine hidden attributes, and the top two most extreme attributes a character has are selected and surfaced in their epithet. So a callous planner has very low compassion and very high rationality. These attributes are influenced by traits, but not always deliberately connected. The trait compassionate gives plus 200 to the compassion attribute, so it's very likely to surface. But a compassionate, vengeful, and greedy character would actually probably shake out as a vindictive ravener. And that's really interesting. Also, the new stress system is an excellent way to make traits relevant. If you play against character type, you'll rapidly drive your ruler to a breakdown. And well, that can be fun for a bit, it becomes significantly disruptive to gameplay very quickly. With stress, 
Traits aren't just passive bonuses to stats and relationships. They're an active part of a player's decision making. If you have a Norse pagan ruler who is compassionate, they're going to have trouble gaining piety from human sacrifice as part of their religion, for example. Traits are a particularly potent secret sauce that when they're tied to gameplay systems in effective ways, allow players to sketch out and focus on the stories that interest them. You don't need them to tell the entire story. In fact, you don't want them to because part of the fun is letting the player decipher what the traits are doing and what they mean. Blood type is a great example of this in Blazeball. You aren't going to be picking your traits just because you think they sound good or because a game you like used them well. You want a specific list of traits that's expressive of the themes, aesthetics, and concerns of your fictional world and of how people are portrayed in it. But you also want every item on that list to hook onto game systems. How much you want to surface the way they tie into those systems is up to you, but that will depend on the sort of game you're making. How much discovery is part of the game loop versus how much gameplay depends on players being empowered to act decisively on their existing knowledge. A trait doesn't have to be a beautifully ornate wonder all on its own, and sometimes it shouldn't be. What it needs is to fit into its context. Sometimes you can have a trait or two that feels ornate, but too many of those without significant work to integrate them into the rest of your game's world will confuse your players and make them wonder how mechanically resonant all of your traits are as a whole. The trait is not just a cool descriptor. It's a key point of communication between a game's systems and a player's extrapolated imagined stories from their playthrough, a vector of translation, if you will. And how you want to translate is up to you. My best advice on finding the right balance is uh, fuck around and find out. Thanks so much. Oh, what a wonderful end. Thank you so much, Kat. It's, it's very, very beautiful. Uh, <laughs> I genuinely mean that. Yeah, no, it's it's excellent advice. It really is. Um, we have plenty of questions. Um, the first one here from, yeah, drink some water. <laughs> the yeah. first question from Taki Alto is, what do you think is the most underutilized trait? How do you think it would impact or improve games if it was used more often? So this is a little bit of a trick question because I don't feel that there's any specific trait that is underutilized, right? Um, it really is going to depend on how you choose to express that trait. So for instance, um, I'm not a huge fan of Chase in Crusader Kings 2, um, but Tanya Short gave me a really interesting way of thinking about that, that trait, that if you use Chase as a way of here is what you can't do. Here are all the things you're closed off from. Then it becomes a passive trait and it's not particularly useful to think about and it's just kind of boring and it kind of sits there. But if chaste means that you're running around yelling at everybody who's having sex, then suddenly your game is much more interesting. And so I think when I think about traits that are underutilized, um, I, would, I would kind of want to emphasize traits that kind of sit there and do nothing and exhort people to think about what they can do to make those traits more active and create surprising gameplay in, in their own work. Yeah, I think that's a great point. Um, another question here, there's a couple similar ones of, if you had to only choose three high level traits or spectrums for characters for the rest of your career, what would they be? What kind of traits would you choose? Oh, um, a spectra, right? Uh, in other words, um, I don't have to choose like three traits, not all of my characters. Yeah, you can, you can choose three spectra. Yeah. Fantastic. Okay. Um, so one of them is uh, uh, beliefs and expressed values, um, how they view the world, uh, that kind of internal uh, view. The other one is uh, how they relate to others, um, the way they express their relationships. And I think the third one in terms of that would be um, how, how likely they are to take specific actions based on both their beliefs and society, i.e. the game systems uh, that are that are default. So those I think would be the three that would be the most interesting for me to explore. Um, that combination of when people act on things, what they act on, and how their relationships are impacted by them and, and how that makes them feel. Yeah, that's fascinating. I'm also so impressed you had an answer ready. That, that felt like I a didn't. hard one. I genuinely didn't. Yeah, uh, off, off the fly, I mean, like coming up with that on the spot. Very impressive. I mean, that's those are the things that I think about the most. I think I'm, I'm most interested in, in, in social design, uh, which doesn't necessarily mean that there aren't other things you can do with traits. But for me, traits are about how your characters interact with the world and not just cool little pieces of paper on a screen. Yeah. 
So those are like my favorite ways to, to, to think about how characters can, can work through their stuff. Yeah. One yeah. Uh, kind of quick question. Cat Manning, can we please have the null team filter that you're using? Oh yeah, absolutely. So this is a snap cam filter and I will uh, tweet what it is. Big fan of snap cam filters these days. Uh, and yes, hello everyone from The Void. Yeah, <laughs> wonderful. Uh, there's an interesting question from Hill Exit of, I wonder if you could make a trait system which was confusing on purpose to show that humans are confusing. What kind of things could you get out of taking all the negatives of bad trait systems intentionally? Oh yeah, no, that is really interesting. Uh, it's terrifying uh, on its surface. Uh, and I think I could do it very easily unintentionally. Um, I, th I, th I think if you just asked me to make a trait system uh, off the top of my head and put in everything I wanted, uh, it would do that very, very easily. Um, but I think one of the things that's really interesting about this uh, to show that, that humans are confusing, um, games like Prom Week uh, are really, really interesting uh, artifacts, but had that problem, right, of there was so much going on under the hood because these characters were so complex. They were really f uh, a little bit uh, frustrating to play. Apologies to all of my friends who made Prom Week. Um, <laughs> this is a bit of a problem. Uh, but essentially what was happening there is the complexity of characters, how much they, they sort of waffled back and forth about what they wanted, how quickly their moods changed, how they felt about all of their friends, made it very, very chaotic. And so I think there is, I, I still think there's a lot of really fruitful work to be done in how to make that confusion legible to people um, in ways that feel non-simplistic, but I don't currently have a, a, a clear hypothesis on what that is. Yeah. Um, I think that's interesting. I mean, I think that calling out, you know, setting and things makes a lot of sense. It makes me think about how um, in games like Until Dawn, I remember mm. a lot of discussion around the fact that the characters in Until Dawn would make really stupid decisions. Uh, yeah. But like the point was that it was playing with the whole like a bunch of horny teens go into the woods and make bad decisions was like the Absolutely. trope. Absolutely. Yes. So uh, of course they would. And I think that quite a lot of people understood that and were uh, they embraced it. Whereas if it was a game like Mass Effect and Commander Shepard was making these extremely foolish decisions, there'd be that dissonance. But then some st some people still found it frustrating of like, why are you going to check on the scary noise? Why don't I have an option to not do this stupid thing? But it's like, well, they're stupid teens. Of course it's what they're going to do. Yeah, and I think there's ways to surface that sort of like more narratively speaking. Um, but yeah, leaning into uh, your simulation's weaknesses is, is always like one of my number one design tips. Um, leverage what you have, make it make sense that way. Um, and, and design toward that actually, rather than, than trying to cover it up. Yeah. Uh, I think last question uh, mm -hmm. is, if you had to pick three traits from any game or combination of games to describe yourself, what would they be? Oh, I've done this before. Um, I think a lot about, uh, I think a lot about who I would be in Crusader Kings 2 specifically. Mm. I tried to, I actually tried to do this with Crusader Kings 3, and my hot pitch currently that I'm not going to stand behind is that the more difficult a, 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 a trait system is to do a really satisfying tag yourself meme with, uh, the more complicated it is to surface to a player uh, what is relevant and what isn't. I like that so, yeah. Uh, uh, leaving out genetic traits from Crusader Kings uh, 2, um, I would probably pick, um, gosh, actually, I'm, I'm, I'm going to do a blend. Um, gregarious, absolutely. Um, scholar. And uh, hmm, I'm trying to think of one that isn't uh, uh, Crusader Kings uh, related. I, I would probably say uh, Dwarf Fortress's knowledge trait. Yeah. I'm gonna pick, I'm gonna pick that or, or, no, I'm gonna actually, I'm gonna pick art because art actually incorporates a lot of what I like about procedural generation design, which is, I, I, I think it is art. So I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna pick art, uh, uh, the, the, the artistic trait. Um, right. That way. Yeah. Nice. Well, excellent. Thank you so much for yeah. joining us, Kat. That was a great talk. Um, Thank very, you so very much. useful. Uh, yeah. We'll Thank see you around the me. conference space. I'll be